Welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Best Deer Hunting Stories of 2019. On almost every show, we ask each guest to share a memorable deer story that is meaningful to them. At the heart of the Big Buck Registry are the stories of the men and women across the world from all walks of life that share a common bond in hunting. We've always felt that the story was just as important as the rest of the show because it brings everything together. If the rest of the show is the textbook, the story is the example. The story brings the hunt to life. So we decided to go back through each show and put together a compilation of the deer stories told throughout the year and share them collectively. Here in part one, we'll hear from Ethan Featheroff, John Eberhardt, John Glidden, Blake Garrett, Cameron Deerfield, J.C. Hall, and Joe Godar. This is part one. Stay tuned for part two releasing right after you finish this one. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Minus 33 Merino Wool Layering System, keeping you warm on the coldest days while staying breathable and wicking away moisture on the wet ones. Rackology, everything you need in one bag. Now available at Rural King and Orsland Farm and Home storefronts or online at www.rackology.org. Grizzly Ears, the most advanced engineered wireless earbuds for the outdoors. Covert scouting cameras, remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security, and Big Buck merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long-sleeve t-shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. And show support for this podcast by visiting BigBuckMerch.com. That's BigBuckMerch.com. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Matt Light, and you're listening to my favorite podcast, the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. This is Milo Hansen. And you're listening to the Big Buck Registry, the Big Buck Podcast. Hey everyone, this is Nikki Boxford from Winchester Life. Get ready to press play on my favorite podcast, Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes. Subscribe and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we're out of harnesses. We need your help. Anybody that has spare harnesses, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. We'll get to the best 2019 best deer stories from the podcast in just one moment. But before we do, let's hear from our friends at Minus 33 Merino Wool Products and Jim Keller with the Deer News. Let's talk about a hunter's layering system for a sec. We need to be ready for any weather that Mother Nature throws at us. With the layering concepts that Minus 33 has created with their incredible Merino wool products, they've got you covered. The Minus 33's Merino wool expedition weight garments will keep you warm on the coldest late season days while regulating and wicking away moisture in a way that only Merino wool can do. You see, wool will absorb up to 30% of its weight and moisture without leaving you feeling wet or clammy, and wool insulates better than cotton or polyester and protects against hypothermia on those late season hunts. And here's another interesting point. You might not think of wool for early season, 
but with the minus 33 wicking technology, I'll take a lightweight minus 33 base layer any day in warm weather. Merino wool fibers naturally reject any bacteria found in moisture or sweat and gives you double protection against odor as your target buck approaches. Visit www.minus33.com to learn more about Minus 33's layering technology. Use the code BIGBUCK33 to get 10% off your next order. Now here's Jim Keller with the deer news. Our first story, Michigan Hunter Sprayed Brother Stand with Deer Repellent. This story is from the Fox News website, reported by Alexandra Diabler. A Michigan man has admitted to intentionally sabotaging his brother by spraying deer repellent around his hunting stands. The Michigan Department of Natural Resources recently responded to a complaint of hunter harassment during firearm deer season in Nuego County. The complaint accused the brother of harassing him while hunting on private land the pair owned together. DNR Conservation Officer Mike Wells, who invested the case, examined two SD cards from trail cameras, which showed the brother wearing a backpack sprayer and spraying two hunting stands located on public U.S. Forest Service property, Michigan Live reports. The DNR collected and tested samples of the liquid sprayed on the stands. According to reports, Officer Wells confronted the suspect as he was hunting in his blind. The man confessed to tampering and harassment. He was also found to have been illegally hunting using bait. The man was reportedly upset because he felt his brother was intentionally cutting off the deer by hunting the public land next to the private camp the pair owned, the Department of Natural Resources shared. The man reportedly apologized and admitted to spraying liquid fence, which is used as a repellent for deer. A warrant request has been submitted by the DNR for hunter harassment and using bait, the outlet reported. Luke Bryan's red stag shot and killed on his farm, authorities say. This story is from the Fox News website and was reported by Mariah Haas. Luke Bryan's red stag was shot and killed on the country music star's private property outside of Nashville last week. The shooting took place sometime between Wednesday evening and early Friday morning, according to a bulletin from the Maury County Sheriff's Department posted to Facebook on Saturday. The deer appeared to be shot from the road, Barry Cross of the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency told the Tennessean. Cross said the incident was reported by Luke's farm manager. The incident is currently being investigated by the Sheriff's Department, and a 5000 reward has been offered for information that leads to the arrest and conviction of anyone responsible, according to the bulletin. Brian and his wife Caroline help operate Brett's Barn on one of their properties, a petting zoo founded by the couple in memory of their niece who died as an infant. Children can come there and interact with horses, pigs, and more exotic animals such as kangaroos and alpaca. It's unclear if the stag was involved with the zoo. A rep from Brian did not immediately respond to Fox News' request for comment. (laughs) Iowa hunting partner shoots house and fellow hunter during opening weekend excursion. This story is from the Fox News website and was reported by Janine Puhak. Talk about a poor shot. One ill-fated hunting excursion in Iowa ended in property damage and a trip to the hospital after one member of the hunting party was shot in the leg. On Sunday, during the opening weekend of shotgun deer season, conservation officers with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources received word that a Logan home was damaged by bullets. An 18-year-old hunter named Chase McGuire was shooting at a deer over a hilltop when his bullets missed the animal and hit a nearby house, KCAU reported. Worse yet, during the same outing, Another member of the hunting party was shot in the leg by one of his fellow outdoorsmen. Craig Brendan, 38, was shot in the leg by another hunter who was firing at a wounded deer, KTVO reports. Brendan, also of Logan, was hospitalized for the injury and later airlifted to the University of Nebraska Medical Center, where he remains in stable condition. Now authorities are working to determine which hunter in the group fired the shot that hit Brendan. An investigation has since been launched into the incident, and no charges had been filed as of Tuesday, per KCAU. Deer killed in Georgia after crashing through driver's windshield. He tried to hitch a ride. This story is from the Fox News website and was reported by Robert Geerty. A female motorist was okay after a head-on encounter with a deer on a Georgia road. It happened on a Thursday morning in Jones County. Not a good way to start the morning, Sheriff Butch Reese said on Facebook. I knew it was cold this morning. I guess the deer was looking for a little heat or maybe trying to get away from a hunter in the woods, but whatever the reason, he tried to hitch a ride. Reese posted a photo showing the dead deer in the vehicle's front seat after crashing through the windshield. The sheriff said the woman behind the wheel was not injured, but she didn't care for a riding partner either. He appealed to hunters to help us out with the deer problem and get them while they are in the woods. WMGTV reported last month from November 1st to November 27th there were 41 accidents between cars and deer in Jones County, far above the usual monthly average of 16. 
That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Groceries Deer News. Special thanks to Tim Donzi, Daniel Applebaum, and John Geis for leads on this week's stories and for leads on stories all year. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. I hope everyone has a safe and happy new year. Well, thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here are the best deer stories from 2019, as told on the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunting Podcast, Part 1. Number 14. First, we hear from Ethan Featherhoff from Episode 281. So it was about uh, June. I was working on building a pole barn. I was swinging some hammers, and I just felt like a weird pop in my shoulder. And I put it off for a couple of days because, you know, sometimes you just pop something and just needs a couple of days to heal. Well, I just noticed my shoulder getting bigger and bigger. So I went in and got an MRI and he told me that my um, AC joint was separated. I had a bone spur and I tore my bicep. Mm. And this is, this is on my shooting arm too. Mm. And my option was get surgery and you definitely cannot shoot a compound bow or you just tough it out. <laughs> and I don't know about you guys, but anytime I have a, an opportunity at a big deer like that, I, I'm, I was like, you know what? I'll just push it off. And I pushed it off all the way to October. <laughs> so that yep. pretty much after, after I shot my buck, I went and immediately got that surgery and kind of a cool picture. If you get on North American white website and look at their article online, it has a picture of me holding the, the skull and the, and the rack, I was actually swinged up because I had the surgery right after I shot the buck. So that was kind of a, a cool thing. That's uh, crazy. So, you, and, and it didn't affect your shot or did you, were you how much pain were you in? A lot, but it's just okay. one of those things, man. I've been through a lot of experiences and pain in my life and I was able to put that off. Uh, a story that I share with a lot of people because um, I, I kind of, in a way, like my entire thing now is I just want to inspire people to chase their dreams and not, not live in fear <clears throat> because in 2014, I almost lost my life in a work accident. Uh, I separated my shoulder. I tore ligaments in my neck and the whole left side of my face was crushed and I was paralyzed for a while. And there was a time when I didn't even know if I was ever going to be able to hunt, talk, walk, or do anything again. And <laughs> to be able to get to this point today of doing the things that I love. I got a beautiful wife. I got two children. <laughs> I was able to harvest a 200 inch deer. I, I just feel blessed, man. And I want to share that with everybody and, you know, just inspire them to, if there's something you love to do, just pursue it, man, because it, nothing's going to make you happy until you do that. That's, that's what I've learned in life. And that's where I'm at now, man, I'm pursuing my dreams. So that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's great that you, uh, had the intestinal fortitude to fight through all that stuff, you know, and, and mm-hmm. work through the pain because you knew that there was a result that you were seeking and you weren't going to let yeah. it stop you. And I, you know, that's, that's not just a lesson in hunting. That's like a lesson in life, right? Like yeah, that, that's for real. across the board. If you can fight through the adversity and the pain to get where you want to be, that's, that's what life, that's what life's all about really. Yeah, man. I, like I said, I'm a, I'm a passionate, emotional guy just because I've, I've been through that. And I just, like I said, when you, when you don't know when something you love is getting ready to be taken away from you and you never know you're going to do it again, but when you get the opportunity to do it again, you cherish it and you do everything you can to keep it going. Number 13. Next, John Eberhardt. Episode 287. And this hunt was in 2004, and it was in Michigan, and um, it was on election day in uh, 2004, and I voted up north, and I drove about two and a half hours down to this spot, and I got there at about noon, and I got in my tree for the rest of the midday hunt and the evening hunt, and I was hunting at a primary scrape area next to two apple trees. And uh, basically there was a swamp on one side of me and then I was up on a hill ridge and then it dropped down into heavy mature timber with 
really dense understudy, briars and bedding area down there too. So I was in a transition zone between these two bedding areas, the swamp and the timber with the heavy understudy. And I'm sitting in the tree. I'm, I'm, I've got the scrapes in front of me with the tree between me and the scrapes. Mm. And I had set this tree up on the southeast side of the scrape area because I don't pay attention to the wind as far as worrying about getting winded. But once in a while, when I'm setting up at a primary scrape area, I'll set the, I'll, if there's a, tree on the southeast side that's what i'll set up because typically the prevailing winds are out of the northwest and a lot of times big mature bucks will come in and scent check a scrape area from downwind without actually coming into it you know they'll stay in the security cover and just scent check it from you know 15 or 20 yards downwind yep. so i'm sitting in the tree and that's exactly what this buck did this buck come come up the hill and He's kind of circling around to the side of the scrapes, and I'm expecting him to come into the scrapes. I always expect him to come in, but this one didn't. And I see he's going to go around to my right. So just like we were talking about a while ago, I started to swing around to 180 degrees. I swung around 180 degrees to the opposite side of the tree, but by the time I got around there and got into position, he had went through my lane because I had a lane to my right, to my 3 o'clock from where I was originally sitting. Yep. So then I swung back around to where I originally was and he circled around and came, I didn't have a shooting lane behind me. He circled around and he came in and he came right up to the base of my tree. My tree's probably 15 yards from the scrape area in the brush. He is standing literally, if I'd have spit, it had fell on him. (laughs) <laughs> standing at the base of my tree, and he did a, lifted his head up and did a little lip curl, trying to win the, win the scrapes. Yeah. And uh, an eight-point had came in earlier that I'd passed on. Uh, he was a small buck. And anyway, he turned around. There was nothing of interest, no does that came in there. So he circled around, and he was going back on the exact same route he came in on. So I swung around the tree because he's going to go back through that lane. And when I swung around the tree, sure as Sure as hell, he was taking the exact footsteps, and when he got to that lane, I, I man, just did a dope, you know, a vocal doe bleat, and he stopped, and I shot him. It was a 154 inch uh, ten point. Wow, gotcha. And it was awesome, and that was one of the things about the saddle with the tree stand. I would not have been able to take that shot because right. it was on. I had to swing around 180 degrees to the opposite side of the tree to take that yeah. shot. Number 12. Next up, number 12, John Glidden, episode 283. All right, so so we'll go northern Pittsburgh. All right. A snowstorm, okay? Yeah. So the day before, we jumped some deer and uh, had an idea where we wanted to go the next day. And there's three of us hunting together. And we get there just at daylight and get dropped off out of the truck. And the truck disappears, and my goodness gracious, it's cold. It's below zero. The wind's blowing. There's probably some new snow falling, and there's an awful lot of it just going from place A to place B right by me. (laughs) You know? (laughs) Yeah, been there. (laughs) You know? And I've got an idea of where I want to go, and I I just start out. I just start hiking. And I cut some old tracks, lose them, cut some more old tracks, follow them, lose them. I make a oh a mile and a half, two mile swing into an area that I've had seen some tracks the day before, and lo and behold, I come across some fresh tracks. I mean, it's miserable. It's miserable. The tracks are disappearing while I'm looking at them. Right. And those tracks, they start right back down to where I've come from. And we're going through clear cuts, thickets, clear cuts, thickets, and out in the clear cuts, I'm losing this track. Now this track is minutes ahead of me. And I'm still losing it, or at one point it was minutes. And I follow that track right back to where I darn near started. And I've got it in my mind that this has to be a buck. It wasn't a big animal. But I said, it's all by itself. He's looking for something. He's searching for something. He's, he's, he's just going, and I'm, I'm going as fast as I can go. I'm darn near running. Big, bulky gear on, you know. I got my backpack. I got my light wool i got my expedition wool bottoms on i got hat on which i take on and off to cool down i unzip my jacket then i zip it back up to keep 
keep my body temperature good. And I'm going and I'm going and I'm going. I'm almost stepping in his tracks. I can't see his foot, you know. <laughs> yeah. I come around a corner and there's this deer and it really baffles me for a second and swings his head and there's some horns on it and that was good enough for me. And uh, so I, I shoot the deer and when I get up to it, it's got f- a nice little five-point rack on one side and it's busted the other side off right at the top uh. of his head. He just busted. And then I look at the, the rack that the, the the side that's that's left and it is wore down it is there's no nubs on it no bumps on it you could tell it was probably six weeks ago it was probably a pretty nice looking rack yeah this guy had just wore his horns down to nothing and how he could break the horn was at least an inch inch and a quarter busted off what happened to that guy to bust that horn right off at the bottom of his head? I got no idea. Got to be something but, uh, big. But that was uh, that was a great hunt. I put in my time. I did everything right. Yep. You know, and uh, and I got my overcame my, the the and, elements. That's right. Yeah. 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 And, yeah, and then you got your buck. Yeah, I got my buck, and then I had to get myself back up over the mountain to where I was supposed to meet my buddies and whatnot. It's not always like, oh, wow, yeah, yeah. now I'm going to get back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, that was just a, a, a fantastic hunt. That's a I good enjoyed, hunt. I enjoyed That's a really it. good hunt. Yeah. yeah. Number 11. Next, we hear from Blake Garrett from episode 282. You know, I'm going to say... Ooh, um, maybe four years ago, um, I had picked up this little bitty 30 acre piece of ground and it wasn't much. It probably had five acres of timber on it. And that was it. And it was within, the timber was within 200 yards of the road. Hmm. So, you know, looking at the property, you wouldn't think much of it. But I knew that the surrounding property and kind of what it connected was good. And I thought, man, I get it and see, I mean, maybe in the rut, you know, we'll have some deer swinging through it. Um, started running cameras on it <clears throat> and ran cameras all summer. Never even picked up a horn buck. Never, I mean, nothing. Just a bunch of those and yearlings. And about September 15th, September 20th, rolled around. And I went in and um, pulled the car and all of a sudden I had like five different bucks on it. Two shooters and um, a bunch of younger, three-year-old on it. And the only thing that changed is the crops had come out to the west of it. So they had harvested the standing corn. So those bucks, like we talked about, those bucks live in the standing corn in summer here. They do at least. Um, so as soon as that corn's gone, they have to suck in this timber. Mm. So they lived in this timber. And I'd only literally I looked at it on Google Earth, and the bigger chunk of the timber kind of bottleneck. And the bigger chunk of the timber, I'd never even walked in. I, it's like still to this day, I've never walked in it. Um, I walked in maybe, oh, I'd say 50 yards from the edge and found a tree that's right in the middle of uh, the bottleneck, put a stand there, and left it. Just thought, you know, we'd run a camera and see what happens. Well, we had a buck show up, <clears throat> really a big eight-pointer, had two giant eye guards, and <clears throat> he had showed up on the camera five days in a row in the daylight. Okay. We're like, okay, yeah, this is game on. Well, he was living in the larger part of the bottleneck on the third at the time. So I had... I had to have a north wind to hunt it. Now you're talking late September at this point, which north winds aren't conducive at that time of the year. Um, it, I had I had like four days. I had to wait until I got a cold front. Wow, and okay. Yeah, so I, I have to sit out of it for four days, so I left it. I got out of the farm, waited, had a cold front that went from 80 to 62 and went down to 60, at 60 or 59 degrees. That was a high that next day so okay. when that cold front came through. So the cold front came through when it did, it pushed rain that morning. Um, so I waited till the evening, went in, got in the tree, um, had a three-year-old deer come by us. That was a great deer, like a mid-30s buck, and probably a 11 or 12 does mm. came by. And uh, we're sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, and then all of a sudden this deer shows up right behind us, comes right underneath us, and I end up shooting him like five yards from the tree. Mm. And uh, gun killed, you know, he runs 150 yards and we're getting wrapped up and all that. And it was really the first time that I'd ever kind of utilized everything as far as minimized places with trail camera, you know, 
viewing him on trail camera and kind of figuring him out on trail camera for when he was there. And then also adapting to waiting for the cold front to get in there and hunt him. Um, it just kind of all came together for the first hunt of the year in Missouri being, it was like October 6th, I think, or something. Um, you know, season had been open almost a month, but we hadn't had a cold front. Yeah. And then we just kind of sat back and wait for it and minimize pressure on 30 acres to kill these 152 inch eight pointer. Um, just a super, super cool thing that where everything worked out, you know, in the end. And it was kind of nice to see it all kind of utilize, you know, three or four different pieces together to get that deer killed. Number 10. Coming in at number 10, Cameron Deerfield from episode 285. So, uh, the, I will say this, the first big buck, bigger buck, my first Pope and Young buck was with a, uh, crossbow. So it didn't get to be in the Pope and Young, but it was, it scored to that, you know, okay. um, where are we going back, I was, to, back to your farm? I was, no, I was 13, 13. Okay. And, uh, we hunted, we was on this farm that we hunted my entire childhood. And, uh, my dad, I was hunting with my dad and my uh, grandpa and we got to where the trail split, and I could you could either go up the hill or around the hill. And my dad pointed up the top of the hill, you know, and I'm 13 years old, maybe weighing 130 pounds. I got 25-pound climber on, on, on my back. I got a crossbow. Um, I shot compound at the time, but I had a PSE, and my buddy dry-fired it and cracked the limbs. So I had to send it back to have it fixed that, that, that summer, and it wasn't fixed in time, so I was crossbow hunting. And... Uh, so I had all this stuff on me, you know, and uh, my dad points to the top of the hill and he says, go up there and just pick you out a tree. And I'm like, you know, and it's dark, you know, and I'm like, well, I ain't going to see no, no uh, deer today. And uh, <laughs> I, I walk up the hill, you know, I find, I find this good flat and it opens into uh, a um, hay field. Well, I get right on the edge of it. And I didn't adjust my climber right. So I get about 15 feet up, and my climber's kind of facing down. And uh, so here I am, uh, 13 years old up in this tree. Climber's all out of sorts. Um, I, I finally, you know, I get settled, and it's about daybreak. And it was real windy. It was October 15th, I, I do believe. And uh, super windy morning. And I'm just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And about 8.30... I look over in that hay field and there's a 10 point staring at me, you know, so I must've stuck out like a, a, a sort of thing. Right. Right. But, uh, he, he's looking at me. So I raise that crossbow up and the whole time he's just looking at me, looking at me, looking at me. And I get him in, the, in, in the, in the scope. And like any young man would, the first thing I look at is his daggone rack, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I'm just looking at him, looking at him and, you know, I think to myself, well, you better shoot him. <laughs> and, uh, so I shoot him and, uh, I hit him a little bit high and he kind of fell down and he tried to get back up, was trying to get back up. Well, I shot him again and we had walkie talkies at the, at the, at the time. Yep. And, uh, I, I, I called my dad and I didn't know he didn't have it on vibrate. So, you know, it's just, doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, <laughs> so, he, right. he, so he gets on the walkie talkie mad cause he thought I accidentally hit the button or something. Yep. I said, dad, I just shot a really big buck. And he's like, and he answered back. He's like, yeah, I bet. I was like, Dad, I'm telling you, I just shot a big buck. I was like, I need you up here. And, it, you know, so I sat there in the in the tree just enjoying it because the deer was laying there dead, you know, and I'm just like, oh, my God, I'm shaking. Like, I, I couldn't have even got down if I if I wanted to. I was shaking so bad. Right, right. And uh, I see my dad kind of top the hill, and he can't see the deer because it's in this little hay field. And, and he was like, well, where is it at? And he threw his hands up, and I'm like, it's, it's in the field. He was like, Mm-hmm. And he just walked across the field and literally almost stepped on that deer. And he and he looked up at me and said, "You got to be kidding." Me. <laughs> and uh, he he didn't see a deer all morning, you know. And neither neither did my uh, uh, grandpa. But you know, I shot that deer and that was my first you know bigger deer. Um, he scored 100 129 or no, I'm sorry, 135 inches. And just a great deer, man. And, uh, you know, for a 10 year old, he had a real chocolate rack, you know, oh, and, yeah, yeah. Just, right. and just a real pretty, pretty deer. And from, you know, and, you know, we, and my dad, I, I finally got down, my dad hugged me, you know, and I, I was crying. Um, you know, you know, it, I'll, I'll, ne I'll never forget that moment. I'm not how many deer I killed. That first good buck was, uh, was, I mean, it was a life changing moment for me. Number nine. 
Next up, J.C. Hall from episode 273. I guess like for me, for deer I killed, um, I killed a, a 208 in Ohio. Okay. What, what, um, year, what year are we going back to? God, I'm so horrible at years. <laughs> what is it now? <laughs> 2019. Gosh, dang. <laughs> I mean, it was like like 18 years ago or something. Okay, all right. So go maybe a one ish, maybe. Uh, I, uh, God, thanks for that. Um, <laughs> I hunted. This was by myself, no camera. Um, I went and hunted Wayne National Forest. Okay, down in Adams County, Ohio. Yep, and no idea what I was doing. Like there wasn't cell phones. I couldn't pull up Google maps and turn it to 3d and see the terrain or anything else. I was just, I pulled my truck on the side of the road and just threw a climber on my back and grabbed my bow and walked. And I mean, I knew uh, everybody always used to talk about Wayne national forest. There's giants there and it was a great place to hunt. And it's, it's state land, you know, or yeah. whatever it's. So I walked, I don't know, close to two miles because growing up in Pennsylvania, you learn when you hunt state game lands yep. that you have to go a minimal of a mile in the woods to get into the deer. Okay. That because makes for sense. the most, for the most part, people go in, they only go a hundred yards, 200 yards off the road. Yeah. And that was a, that was a study done by Pennsylvania state game commission that, because people are saying there's no deer on state game lands and they did a study and found the deer were just pushed further back in the woods. Obviously it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so people just don't get far enough in the woods. So I took that knowledge and just walked, man, and just kept walking, walking, started seeing the further you walk in, you know, I started seeing more deer sign. And then I got to where I started seeing some rubs, started seeing some scrapes, and found three white oak trees that were dropping acorns. And I was like, oh, this makes sense. You know, they're, this is where I would be if I was a deer. You know, there's white acorns. That's, you know, that's always been known to be one of the top food sources for white-tailed deer. Yeah. So I climbed up in a tree, and an hour later, <laughs> 280, this deer walked underneath me, and I smoked them. <laughs> wow. It, it was like, it's a quick story, but. But but important that that, but, that, right. that that one is huge, man. Because I took just things I've learned, things I've heard, heard people talk about. I'd never been there before. I had no idea what I was doing, where I was going. Mm-hmm. You know, I just knew I wanted to get as far off the road as I could because it's public land, and knew I wanted to find food as close to a bedding area as I can. So when I started seeing the rubs and scrapes come more significant you know i mean where you can look around and see okay there's a rub there rub there rub there there's a scrape there and a scrape there you're close to a bedding area right because you know a lot of times the mature buck is they make those signs close to their bedding area for you know establishing their home yeah. and as soon as i saw that and saw the white oaks that were dropping i knew i wanted to get up in the tree and dude, it was it may, it may not even have been an hour and that deer walked out and i shot him at 20 yards you you pieced together a <laughs> bunch of different knowledge that you've acquired over the years, and right. and you made it happen in a short amount of time, and, and that's a lot of times that's all it takes. But you you keyed in right. on on pressure, you keyed in on bedding areas, and you keyed in on food. Right. What, right. what else is there? And it was like I got in. I mean, where those scrapes and rubs were, you know, I mean, I seen it started getting thicker behind them. I made sure the wind was in my face to where I thought the deer would be bedding. Yep. You know, I mean, it's just little things like that, yep. and. It, it all came together. And That's a great illustrated it was, story. It was, it was awesome. Right? <laughs> Man. Right. There was a tank, two drop tines, kickers everywhere. I mean, it was just, it was right. unbelievable. Right. So. I mean, what a good way to illustrate right. the, the quintessential elements of being a su- successful deer hunter. It's all right, right there in that one package. Perfect. Well said. Thanks, man. I've never really thought of it like that. Right. <laughs> all right. I then. just, I mean... It's almost like you don't even think of it anymore. You know what I mean? You, you hunt nature, so much right, and you learn right. so much. You just, you go in and you know exactly what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be straight off of that. And you know, that's what you got to do to, you know, and I say big deer and mature deer. I mean, there's so much of an argument anymore about, you know, people only shooting 170 inch deer or bigger. And 
I mean, that's not reality. You know what I mean? It's every big deer I shot. If a smaller, mature deer would have more mature deer would have walked out before I would have, I would have took that deer. Yeah. You know, it's just, just happened to be, it, it's, it's to what the hunt means to you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? To the size of the animal doesn't matter. Yeah. It's people get too wrapped up in that. I mean, I, I, I don't care. I mean, a kid shoots a spike, you know, that's, that means just as much as a guy killing a 180 or 200. Oh, heck yeah. You know, if not more, it's size means absolutely nothing. All we try to do is kill is, is hunt mature deer. Right. You know, right. right. Four and a half, five and a half and older. Yeah. Um, yep. I like the mature aspect. Right. Um, but the hunt, the hunt, the meaningful hunt, I think is more important than that. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Number eight. And rounding out part one of the best deer hunting stories of 2019 on the Big Buck Registry Deer Hunt Podcast, Joe Godar from the Hunting Junkies in episode 278. Well, this one is out of our property for sure. Um, I had hunted this property before I bought it for years, and I had seen, you know, I, I told people that a buck that I saw out there was a 300 class deer. And the the short story on that is that we were out hunting the rut with uh, two of my other friends. In the morning, the guy farthest away from us at the back of the property shot an eight pointer and wanted us. He said he for sure got it. He got down, couldn't find it. He wants help blood tracking. And my other friend and I were in, hunting the same ridge and we had both seen shooter, you know, bucks all morning just chasing and running. So I was a little resistant to get out and go help him track you know halfway across the other side of the property and i told him let's let's just wait well my friend said i'm going let's go with me we're going to spend one hour from 12 to 1 looking we're going to get back in our tree stands we couldn't find it um we decided to get back in our tree stands i come walking back down the trail left my climber on a tree and i got back put my feet in the climber i'm going up i'm about eight feet up and about 10 feet in front of me to my left a deer that had been bedded down stood up Mm. and my first opinion was, that's a horse's butt. What is a horse doing back in these woods? <laughs> that's the first thing that hit me is like, there's a horse standing there. And with that, the deer, you know, swung his head from one side to the other and looked behind him, which was looking at me. And then I saw the rack and he, no, no kidding. He, he just looked like an elk and he just walked away. Mm. So he walked in there and bedded down while I was out looking, you know, to help my but he find that the deer that he shot that we did not find. Right. Um, that got me going more, you know, to, to have an encounter like that was, it, it was just mind boggling when if you're a hunter or fisherman and you have an encounter like that, it sold me. I mean, I was like, I've got to get a large buck one of these days in my life. Yeah. And so that kind of made me crazy to get this property developed. Um, that's, you know, I, recently purchased part of the property and just put everything I can into it to make it better. And years went by. And I remember my wife saying, you know, why do you take so many people out there hunting? You keep talking about, you want to get a big buck. What if they shoot a big buck? I'm like, that'd be great. Just somebody I want. To, and by big buck, I mean, you know, a really big buck. Yeah. Um, 200 rocket over 200. Yeah. 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 And then another, uh, encounter I had, um, I don't know how big he was, uh, but dogs were chasing him. And he just ran right through the property, ran right underneath me at 10 yards, going 50 miles an hour, and away he went. Hmm. Um, and then, lo and behold, one day in 2012, during the rut, I just the, the thing I, I think that more hunters could really do well with is all-day sits. Because so many of the times I've encountered the very, very large deer are, you know, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, in the middle of the afternoon, 60 right. degrees in November but you stay in your stand all day. Right. And I had made the commitment to do that. And it, it got so warm on this November uh, 9th day, I think it was 2012. Um, I did not see one deer all morning and I stood up and I'm like, I'm going to eat my sandwich and I'm going to take one layer of clothing off and I'm going to sit back down. And the minute I sat down and put the bow in my hand, this buck came up to my left and we had had this deer on camera previously Mm -hmm. but the pictures were so bad i couldn't tell what it was gotcha and i i went back over the you know after this and found him 
And I'm like, that has to be him, and that has to be him. But there was not a clear enough picture to even tell exactly what he was. Yeah. And I had the wind with me that day with where he was coming from out of a draw up onto a logging trail. He was at 20 yards, and I was in perfect position. Shot him, made a perfect shot, uh, quartering away. He reared back like I've never seen a deer ever. He was up on his hind legs like a bronking stallion, huh. making grunts and noises like I've never heard of, and I was like in shock. Huh. And he he went down on the ground and did a circle like a break dancer. Yep, yep. And yep. blood was everywhere. And I'm just like, I, I thought, should I shoot him again? And I'm like, no, he's going to die right here. And he gets up and he goes down the way he came, and he performs this break dance like three times going down this hill. Hmm. And then I hear this giant yelp and scream and holler at the bottom of the draw, which I can't see, but I know where he is. And then dead silence. Hmm. And my buddy that was hunting with me that day, I texted him. He came up. And about an hour after that, we waited and went down there and he was gone. Couldn't find him. Hmm. And we did everything. We searched. Um, at the time, I didn't have a blood tracking dog, but I do now for that reason. And we called every shop in town looking for dog tracking. And at 5 o'clock before it was getting dark, I just told him I'm going to walk around the entire property and just take a walk on the logging trail just to see what I can find. I get about half a mile to three-quarters of a mile away from where I shot him. I decided to take a right and go back to him to get on the ATV, and he was laying dead at the crossroads of uh, two trails. Wow. Three-quarters of a mile from where I shot him. Wow. <laughs> three-quarters of a mile. He, yeah, and the blood stopped. Um he had such a tough brisket. Even the uh, the taxidermist was like, what was up with that deer? I physically could not get my knife into him. Huh. I mean, and the arrow went in, you know, quartering away, and it broken off and got probably six to eight inches in there. So it, I think I penetrated at least one lung, but it just covered up. So the initial blood stopped, and he just started walking up this hill and went away, and we, we just lost blood after 100 yards. Mm. And that was my deer of a lifetime. He went... Uh, 223 gross, and wow. um, he's a Boone Crockett hanging on the wall. Just the, one of those big, like you said, big horse bucks, man. Those things are just yeah. big and brutal and tough as nails. And and sometimes those bucks live with with those shots, and you just can't figure it out. And, and look how far he went. It's insane. Yeah. And my friend, Don, that was with me, he had seen the buck coming up a, a creek, and mm. it was kind of heading in his direction. Mm. And I had rattled when I ate my sandwich and everything before I sat down. Yep. And he said that deer physically turned around and went my direction. So mm. I, I'm confident I rattled him in. Yeah, yeah. But Don got to stare at him for a half hour. I did not. And when he knew that I shot that deer, he's like, there, there is no way you've... Because I didn't get a chance to look at the antlers. I mean, he came through this thicket. I'm like, it's a shooter. Grabbed my bow, shot him, and it was over. Hmm. And he studied him. He's like, dude, that thing has got more points. I don't know how many it has. We, we got to find it. So he's texting all of our friends, telling everybody I shot this big deer. And here I'm in total disbelief, not even knowing if we're going to find this deer. Right. And and I didn't want to be the guy to tell the story about the one that got away. Right. I just, you know, it was four hours of total desperation <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> looking for him. Wow. And then finally getting him. Um, yeah, like I said, my only regret is I did, we had filmed some hunts back then but not as much as we're doing now and that was my only regret is i did not catch that on film well that finishes part one part two is coming up next